All right. Well, Lydia, thank you again for, for joining. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of listening to Lydia at uh, the National Meeting of the Wildlife Society and was really uh, uh, intrigued and impressed by the program. So without uh, further to do, I'm just going to pass it on to Ty to uh, formally introduce Lydia and then we'll kick things off here. Okay, thanks, Raul, and uh, thanks for joining us, Lydia, and for all the people online and here in person. Uh, I also met Lydia uh, for the first time at, at the TWS conference in Washington. She had a great uh, plenary talk, and I consider her a new friend now, so I hope even after all this, all the technological difficulties we had today that she still considers me a friend. Um, I'm just going to let her take it from here so that we don't take up more time. Well, Niala, for having me. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry about the technical issues. I told Ty I got the uh, the time zones wrong. For some reason, I thought that CST was just an hour behind Pacific time. And I'm, I'm out here actually in Oregon on uh, Chepanafa Kalapuya land. Um, and I uh, definitely did that math wrong. So I'm so sorry <laughs> for showing up late here. Um, but Again, Yama for having me. Sego, 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 Welcome to where I'm doing. Lydia Young Katz. My name is Lydia, and I'm from the Wolf Clan of the Ganyan Kayaka, from the Walker Mohawk Band of Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, so just over the border up in Canada is where my family is from. Um, and I am the executive director of Hunters of Color. Um, I am really excited to be talking uh, to this seminar because of the importance, I think, of um, our relationship with the land as Indigenous people and with the animals, um, with the Indigenous indigenous uh, species that we have lived beside for so long, um, as someone who hunts and as someone who leads a nonprofit that helps people of color get into hunting. Um, I really pride myself in, in respecting um, our mother, the earth, and respecting nature. Um, and also having that relationship where we take care of the earth and she takes care of us. Um, and I'll get into all of that a little bit more um, as I go throughout my speech, but I just was really honored um, by Ty and Texas A&M for inviting me um, and for considering that, this, uh, that hunting is an important part of traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so again, y'all for having me. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Hunters of Color at the end, but before we go any further, I'd like to start out um, how I always start out most speeches or gatherings or um, anything like this. So um, with a little bit of the Thanksgiving address, the Mohawk Thanksgiving address or Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address. Um, and with that said, I'll be speaking in Ganyangea, which is our Mohawk language. Um, and if you will, Ty or uh, Royal or Sarah want to go to the next slide, um, I'll tell you when to change it to the third slide. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. The Tino or Dunsne, Gayon Tosela, the Tino or Dunsne, Gunderio, the Tino or Dunsne, Ogulasua, Tonya do have a one go la. Next slide. Do she then or Dunsne, Sunkuri Dun, Tonya do have a one go la. Um, I shared this also at the Wildlife Society where Royal and Ty were. And again, I share it at almost everything I can. Um, Mohawk elder Tom Porter, once I asked him, you know, should I should I share this if, the, if it's not a, a entirely Haudenosaunee or Iroquois uh, gathering? And he said, anytime you have something good to share, share it. So um, I do like to start out with the opening address. Um, in any, any gathering, but especially when we're talking about traditional ecological knowledge, um, I think that the way that we approach the earth is really evident in this opening address. Um, again, back to just the second slide, we give thanks to the people, we give thanks to our mother, the earth. We're recognizing um, and greeting um, the earth, the waters, the fish, the fruits, the grass, the trees, the animals, the food, um, and our creator for all of those things. Um, 
And I think that this is just an evidence of traditional ecological knowledge in the importance of uh, Haudenosaunee culture and Mohawk culture. And um, from a traditional ecological knowledge standpoint, just that um, respect that we see, there's so many differences between every indigenous culture um, on this continent in South America and one of the overarching familiarities and similarities that I always see is that respect for our mother, the earth who takes care of us and, and we take care of her in return. Um, so before I go any further, um, again, Yawa for having me. Um, and I'd like to start with just a couple of stories like I did at the wildlife society conference that kind of show me the importance of the work that I'm doing at hunters of color. Um, and that everyone in this field of traditional ecological knowledge is doing. Um, so this first story goes back to when I was a freshman in college. I was uh, at Oregon State University um, here in Corvallis, again, on the Chepinafa band of the Calipuya land. And my roommate, uh, showed up and it was this, it was a random roommate placement. I'm sure many of you have dealt with this as well, but a random roommate placement. And she showed up to our dorm room. We're both 18 years old and she had bags and bags of clothing. Most of them were designer brands that had, um, the tag still on them. And it, I instantly was like, Whoa, I don't understand this lifestyle at all. And this is going to be kind of a culture shock for me. And little did I know it was going to get even worse from there. Um, the first thing I did when she came down from Seattle, she's from Bainbridge Island, which I think is where Bill Gates is also from. Um, if it tells you anything about the, the affluence up there. Um, she came down and I decided to take her fishing because that's all I knew uh, how to entertain somebody. And so I took her to this little honey hole out in the, out in the woods in, in a field um, south of town. And I felt like a really special thing for me to be sharing with her. But uh, the second we got there, she said, um, can we go now? <laughs> and it kind of broke my heart, but it also just kind of showed a disconnect. And the worst, that wasn't even the worst of all, on the way to this beautiful little honey hole um, on the Long Tom River, a tributary of the Willamette River here in Oregon, um, we were dry. I was driving, she's in the passenger seat, and she screams, wait, stop the car. And so I, I panic, I slam on my brakes, and I say, what, what is it? And she says, look, and points, a deer. And so she had me slam on the brakes because she saw a deer. And then she says, I, you know, I've never seen a deer except for in a zoo. And it, it shocked me. I think I laughed at her. I still kind of do. But now looking back, it breaks my heart because of that disconnect. Because this person who I, I mean, has lived such a different life than I have really had that disconnect where, you know, she, she'd never seen a deer in the wild. Um, and, you know, she eats meat um, and probably has never stopped to think where that meat comes from. And for me, as a hunter and as someone who grew up um, eating traditional foods, I know where my food comes from. I know where my meat comes from. And it doesn't come from factory farms. Um, it comes from that relationship that we have with, with the land and with animals. Um, something that uh, my elders have taught me, too, is that we have an agreement with nature and with the animals. Um, and again, that that's, you know, I'll take care of the land. We will create um, and, and make sure that the habitats are there for the deer and the elk um, and for whatever animal, other animals uh, we use for subsistence need to survive and thrive so that we in turn can survive and thrive. Um, so anyways, that's my first first little storytelling session uh, about my roommate in college. And I'd like to juxtapose that to the opposite. Um, with my nonprofit, we do a lot of work with other uh, land protectors, water protectors, and storytellers. And one of the wonderful people that we were able to meet was Teresa Harlan. She's one of the elk protectors from the Felix Cove Alliance. Um, 
and she works with the Thule elk herds out there in the central coast of California. Um, the Thule elk were once, uh, they are endemic to the state of California, and they were once some 500 head strong now, or 500,000 head strong, sorry. And now there's somewhere around 5,000 of them left, which is up from 38, <laughs> 38 animals total um, after the onslaught of uh, Western civilization, I put in quotation marks, I wish you could see, <laughs> but on, after the onslaught of um, colonialism, moving westward, westward expansion, um, and the taking of in, of indigenous lands, the Miwok and Pomo, especially along the, the coast there in central California, um, the Thule elk were decimated as the land was um, ravaged as well. And I had the the precious pleasure of being able to meet Teresa Harlan, who is working to restore her relatives there. Um, Teresa is actually um, Pueblo, but she was adopted by um, a Coast Miwok woman and has dedicated her life to restoring the habitat of the Thule elk so that the Thule elk can come back in the abundance that they once were. So anyways, I, with, with Hunters of Color um, and our program coordinator, had the honor of going down to the Point Reyes National Seashore where we met up with Teresa and her partner, Tiger. And we were walking around looking for elk. It's this beautiful sunny day. Um, and if anyone is familiar with the central coast of California, it's a beautiful sunny day. That's also extremely windy and cold. Um, and so we're walking around looking for elk. And all of a sudden I see this brilliant smile cross Teresa's face. And she just lights up like a candle and she waves this big full arm swing wave up in the air and yells, hello, my relatives. And so I turned to see what she was seeing as this little skinny, emaciated, uh, scruffy looking cow elk crested over a rise. And then another and then another and a little fork was following them. And then um, a pregnant uh, female came over as well. And it was just so beautiful to watch this little family cresting over the rise and recognizing that that family, that connection that Teresa has to those animals is deeper even than that joy that I felt just seeing those creatures. It's her family. It's her relatives. It's like seeing a long lost, long lost cousin or a long lost grandma or grandpa that you haven't seen in a long time. That's the, the, the spirit that I could feel from Teresa. And even then I have to recognize, you know, that that connection is so much deeper than what I can put into words and what I even felt in that moment from her. Um, and I just think about those two stories with these two ungulates that we ought to have connections with. We all ought to have connections with and how much more powerful and how much more substance there was to Teresa's experience seeing these creatures and my roommate's experience with seeing a deer. Um, I often am, uh, think about and, and I tell people about the difference between someone who hunts as someone who uh, manages the land and someone who actually plays a role in the ecology versus someone who just um, maybe recreates or maybe enjoys the outdoors, but, but doesn't actually hunt or fish. And again, <laughs> there's so much beauty in the outdoors and there's so much to be said for bird watching or hiking, uh, kayaking, rock climbing, whatever it is that you like to do. But I truly do believe that the most human we can be, um, and especially for us indigenous folks, um, here in the Western hemisphere, uh, the most alive we can be is when we are interacting with our relatives and when we are truly playing a role in the ecology, um, like Teresa and my family and so many that have gone before us. And Teresa actually shared with me on this trip that one of the difficulties that she finds in uh, trying to conserve and trying to actually just help, to put it plainly, the Thule elk, is so many organizations and groups that want to help fund 
her work or want to help her um, protect the elk get very angry with her when she talks about the importance of elk, the Thule elk in particular, in ceremony um, and in uh, and in diet and in what they mean for coming of age for especially young men um, in, in being able to hunt them. And that's something that she was so, she was so excited when Hunters of Color reached out because she said, oh, you're not going to be mad at me that we actually need to harvest these animals in order to have a full relationship with them. And I said, of course not. But this is something that that we actually come in contact a lot with as well. And it's, again, one of the reasons I'm glad that Texas A&M and, and Ty thought to invite me and thought to invite hunters of color to speak. We often um, feel that as indigenous people and as people practicing traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous-led conservation, that we're put in a box. We're put in a big green box. And the way that Big Green often wants us to act, um, Big Green organizations, I mean, want us to act is different than how our elders have taught us to interact with the earth and with our mother, the earth. And so I think that this is really important to get across. And it's also something that I've noticed um, in, in credit Lydia? to... Lydia, yeah. I, 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 sorry to interrupt. This is Roel. Uh, did you want us to move your slides? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you for interrupting. Uh, so, so, number seven. Got it. My partner, Jimmy, and Teresa, and her partner, Tiger. Yes, we're, we're, we're tracking. So, if you could just say next slide. Uh, uh, Sarah, Perfect. Thank we'll you. Yeah, thank you for interrupting. I appreciate it. Um, so those are the scrawny little Thule elk. And I. it's funny, I living here in Oregon, I've grown up with um, both uh, Roosevelt elk here on the West Coast and then Rocky Mountain elk on the East Coast, or uh, sorry, on the on the Eastern part of the state. And so these little Thule's are just so cute <laughs> and petite in comparison to the elk that I'm used to. And they're just precious. But thank you again, Roel, for um, interrupting me. I'm glad you all got to see the, the elk here. Um, and I hope that you can hear, <laughs> even in the reverence that Teresa has for these animals, and even the way I describe them as cute and precious, um, that hunters often get a bad rep for, you know, oh, we just like hurting animals, or you just like killing animals. And clearly that is so not the case, and especially when it comes from an indigenous perspective and standpoint of, of right relationship with the earth. Um, and in playing an active role uh, in the ecology. And I think that that's what Teresa taught me on this day, or, or at least um, confirmed on this day, um, why this is so important for the animals that we care about, not just from an ecological standpoint, not just from a um, you know, proper uh, circle of life standpoint, but actually from a relational standpoint as well, why these animals are so important and why indigenous led conservation um, is the is the secret, is the key to a future of a planet that lives in right relationship with each other and um, other species. And I'm just looking at these pictures again of the elk and thinking um, about what a joy that day was. Um, I think that when I talk about traditional ecological knowledge, uh, Dr. Jessica Hernandez, who I'm so excited I saw uh, was on the upcoming speaker list for this seminar um, in a few weeks. And I think about what Jessica, Dr. Jessica Hernandez says about traditional ecological knowledge and how it almost has an air of um, antiquity or looking to the past, um, which is clearly true and in, in anyone from any indigenous uh, background knows the values that we have of our past, our elders, our ancestors. And Dr. Hernandez suggests that we talk about these things in the form of indigenous led conservation, because while traditional ecological knowledge might look to the past, indigenous led conservation implies something that's happening now or that can happen in the future. And so I think about what that looks like in supporting. Um, Dr. Jessica, or Dr. Sorry, in supporting Teresa Harlan um, in 
reading and learning the works of people like Matina Sami, who I believe will be speaking for your seminar uh, next week on on caribou and indigenous life conservation on the caribou populations in British Columbia, um, and really bringing traditional ecological knowledge to the now to the forefront in the in the terms of uh, indigenous life conservation ILC. And I'm sure Dr. Hernandez will get into that more whenever she's able to come speak for your seminar. Um, but speaking of Matina Sami, a colleague and a good friend um, who is one of the best researchers, I believe, in this field of modernizing the discussions around traditional ecological knowledge. Um, Matina Sami is a caribou biologist in British Columbia. Um, and he is Wyandotte, so a, a northeastern brother of mine as well. And he'll be talking next week, I believe, about the caribou um, in British Columbia and across Canada and indigenous life conservation uh, for their habitats and that species. And something that he and I often discuss is the, the past, the, what I was just referring to, looking to the past, looking to traditional ecological knowledge and the way that Indigenous peoples, again, across the Western Hemisphere and, and throughout the world, really, have actually been a huge part of managing the landscape and manipulating the landscape. And manipulation almost has a negative connotation, but I say it out of respect. Um, the way that we really have been able to work alongside nature in a way that Western science might not consider it actually land management or wildlife management. We truly have been managing key species and key environments for those species because they are our relatives and because they're so important to our culture. So many languages uh, depend on animals and, and ecosystems and plants that we rely upon. Um, I often think about the otters along the West Coast that have been managed by indigenous peoples up and down from from British Columbia down through Baja California um, and other species as well, such as whales and forests. Um, I don't know about at Texas A&M if y'all have felt any of the repercussions of our forest fires out here on the West Coast, but as somebody living in Oregon, <laughs> it's been shocking um, from you know, living here the past 10 years, I've seen it change from from a, a fire every now and then you'd hear about now to expecting the sun to be shrouded with smoke throughout most of August and September. And I always get frustrated around that time of year because we hear people ask, why is this happening? How is this happening? Clearly, there are a lot of scientific reasons for um, why the forest fires have gotten so much worse here on the West Coast. But one of the biggest ones is glaring to me, and I think anyone else who works in um, TEK or indigenous like conservation, is that the original stewards, the, the people who have managed the, the forest here for so long, have not been empowered to lead conservation work and have not been empowered to lead cultural fires or burns, prescribed burns, um, the way that we have we've been, we're able to for so long, actually throughout the continent and throughout um, what we would call the United States today, we see these historical remnants of prescribed burns, of cultural fires, of every four years, the Calapuya here in Oregon burning back um, the brush so that we don't have all the fuel to actually uh, make the forest fires worse so that we're creating the oak savanna habitats that the, that the elk, that the grouse, that the deer, you name it, need to survive. Um, and that the forest actually needs to thrive as well. And this is something that I, I think about on a pretty regular basis, especially towards the end of fall every year, or towards the end of summer every year here on the West Coast. Um, how often indigenous-led conservation is kind of brushed aside as um, mythical or as uh, something from the past, or it isn't um, it isn't held in the same regard as Western science in so many ways by so many people. And how frustrating it is to me to see these forest fires and then to hear 
people who study uh, Western Western science, like dendrochronology, for example, looking at the tree rings and and seeing, oh yeah, these forest fires have been pretty intentional. Have been said every four years or so, um, you know, throughout the nation, depending on what the forest needed. It's it's almost as though they won't accept the the knowledge and the actual fact of the scientific method going into all of this work, all of these, you know, learning how to manage the forest well through thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial, they won't accept that knowledge unless it has a Western uh, Western science stamp of approval, like a degree or a fancy word like dendrochronology, studying tree rings. Um, but I say all of that, to, I'll get off my soapbox, but I say all of that just to, to say how we look at the past and, and, and I believe by looking at the past, we have a key to the future uh, of a healthy planet by reinvigorating these traditional methods. Um, and I believe that what that looks like is funding. I believe it looks like support for indigenous led uh, organizations and groups. Um, and I believe it looks like some of that power shift being given back to the people who as Oneida comedian Charlie Hill would say, have the owner's manual for this land. Um, I'll shift a little bit now just to talk about hunters of color. And so if you go to the next slide, I don't know if you have or not yet, um, Sarah and Roel. Yep, um, great. Um, that's me in the middle there with some of our mentees uh, and clearly a mentor there on the right. Um, we at Hunters of Color run a mentorship program. Uh, we're active in 12 states. And our mentorship program brings people who are interested in hunting, uh, fishing, and conservation into the outdoors, into community in the outdoors. Um, and so we create these communities. Like I said, we're active in 12 states. We don't call them chapters. They're communities. Um, we actually just got started in Texas, I believe in Lubbock, um, with our first Texas community. I know it's a big state, <laughs> but if anyone's interested, we can definitely get you more information on that. Um, but we provide mentorship and we provide um, what we call a three-tiered model of mentorship where people can come in as beginners, say you've never uh, really spent much time outdoors and we'll teach you how to camp. We'll teach you how to, how to layer for cold nights out there in the desert that get hot during the day. Um, we'll teach you how to track and how to call. Um, and we'll treat, teach you the basics. Then we can shift, uh, to the next level, which will actually get you hands-on experience, um, with archery equipment, um, with fishing gear. And then the third tier is actually going on, um, hunts. And we talk about the, the importance of conservation um, as part of hunting uh, and as part of, or the importance of hunting as conservation um, from a TEK lens. And even beyond that, hunting contributes about $1.6 billion a year to conservation through taxes um, and sales of uh, hunting shooting equipment. Um, and and according to statistics from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 97% of hunters identify as white, which doesn't surprise a lot of people when I when I say that. Um, I often start my conversations when I'm doing an elevator speech with, okay, picture a hunter. Now, did you picture me? <laughs> and people usually laugh and say, oh, no, I pictured my uncle, you know, my uncle Bill in his flannel. And, uh, he kind of looks like Elmer Fudd, you know. But the truth of the matter is that all of us, come from hunters. None of us would be alive right now if our families at some point weren't hunters and they had to be pretty damn good hunters too, or else we wouldn't be here. Their genetics would not have been passed on. And I think especially for indigenous peoples, that connection with the land is so important. Um, this past year in 2022, we launched our indigenous outreach, outreach, outreach program um, as an indigenous led organization. It's something that's really um, heavy on my heart. And then also our, uh, Indigenous Outreach Coordinator is uh, Yaki and Modoc, and he is starting what he's, he's called it a uh, reservation tour. <laughs> so if anyone's interested in getting uh, Josh out to um, your reservation, let us know. But he uh, right now is doing archery classes for youth and adults um, 
here in Oregon. I think the Klamath Reservation is next on the list. Um, but he's doing archery uh, intros and classes. He's a certified archery instructor. And for adults, he's teaching um, traditional Modoc bow making. Um, so that's always really important and, and kind of precious way to, to show that connection to the land. Um, so that's a little bit about hunters of color. And I think I'll leave you now um, with one more story, if it's okay, um, just to kind of emphasize the importance of, of hunting um, in my heart and, and in my, my experience. Um, my partner and I uh, both hunt, and he is um, Afro-Indigenous from Venezuela and also Filipino on his dad's side. Um, and so you can go ahead, uh, Roel or Sarah, switch to the next slide, and I'll tell you a little bit about this elk. So this is my partner, Jimmy, um, also our program coordinator here for Hunters of Color. And this um, elk was a gift that allowed Jimmy and I to now eat what we call hunterarian. We do not have to eat a single piece of meat from a fat animal. Um, and I'll tell you just uh, in brief, and I only have 10 minutes left about this elk. So it was, oh gosh, two summers ago now, or two falls ago now, we were uh, camping out on the Oregon coast. And if anyone has camped or hiked or hunted the Oregon coast, you know the density you can see it there um, in that overgrown forest where the Kalapuya should be empowered to manage, but have not been. Um, but the overgrown forest there, the density of it, we were out there for a few days without any success. Um, and on the last day uh, of the hunt, the night before, I had a dream that I was standing on the cliff's edge and all of these bull elk were tumbling down this cliff and falling down this cliff. And it was beautiful and tragic and really stuck with me. So the next morning I woke up at first light with Jimmy and his um, hunting partner, Reese, who was Choctaw. And they were about to go out uh, for the last day. I was going to stay in bed and sleep. Um, and But I, before they left, I said, hey, this is going to sound crazy, but I had a dream and you should look for a cliff. That's where you'll find your elk. And I felt kind of silly saying it, right? I was like, oh, it doesn't work. I'm going to sound like this, you know, crazy indigenous woman who thinks that I have these connections and I don't. <laughs> and so anyways, I, I had this, uh, I had this dream. I tell Reese and Jimmy, they take off on their mountain bikes, uh, which is a pro tip if you ever are, in terrain where you can use a mountain bike. Um, it helps with the pack out quite a bit. And in this case, they needed them. It was a good sign. So they're on their mountain bikes. I'm sleeping, but I hear the story when I, when they get back. Um, I was actually, I, I woke up, I was cleaning and they were gone for quite a while. They left at first light. It was like one in the afternoon and I was starting to worry. There's no cell service where we were, but I was starting to worry and get excited because if you've ever been on a hunt before, you know that that, that means something good happened, most likely, if someone's taking too long to get back. So all of a sudden, I hear the mountain bikes come rolling into camp, and Jimmy yells, Lydia, you were right. Your dream was correct. And I instantly had these chills over my body, and I, I was like, what do you mean? So he went on to tell me that he and his buddy were biking on this little trail his friend was right in front of him and as he was biking his friend put up his hand meaning stop just as you would you know say whoa on a horse he put up his hand and point and put up a stop and jimmy who had just gotten this mountain bike tried to stop but his bike squeaked uh, because it was brand new and so he squeaked to a halt right next to his friend and as he did, he looked up and there was a bull elk about 40 yards in front of them. And he, he thought that he had blown it just from that squeak and just from coming up too quickly and not seeing the stop sign in time. But the elk kind of looked at them and then just turned around and went back right back down to grazing. And so Jimmy was able to um, come up, sneak up slowly, take a deep breath, Ask the animal for permission, which again is something that 
I think there needs to be more of. Um, it's something that we've always practiced um, to ask for permission, and you'll feel a check in your spirit if you are not supposed to harvest that animal, or um, it can be for used for plants and medicines as well. But he asked this animal for permission. He felt the animal give him permission, and he took the shot. And at, after he took the shot, he waited as you're supposed to, and then went to go find the blood trail. And when he found it, you can see from this photo that he was laying on the edge of this cliff. And it's kind of hard to tell the scale here, um, but his, if you can tell how big his head looks compared to the rest of his body, he's down a pretty deep, steep cliff. Jimmy actually walked up before he realized how steep the cliff was. He actually walked up and placed his hand on on the elk's head and thanked him for his sacrifice and for his food, for his um, sustenance that will then provide him and his family with sustenance. And then he went to stand up and the elk started falling down the cliff, tumbling down the cliff, just like it had in my dream. And so he actually had to grab it, yell for his friend to go get some cord, some cordage. So he's using it, it looks like baling twine to, to tie up his antlers to a tree so that he wouldn't fall down this cliff. And so the dream came true. Unfortunately, for, unfortunately, it made for a more difficult pack out. And I and I always joke now, you know, creator, why can't you send me a dream that says, you know, there's 500 yards visibility and an easy drivable uh, range where you can back your truck up instead of having to pack it out one by one, quarter by quarter. But this is what this is what was given to me in my dream, and this is what was given to to our family. And again, for two years now, we haven't had to buy any meat from the store, um, and it's just been such a blessing, and such a reverence, such a connection, and such a difference. And you can go ahead and switch to the next photo, the uh, Tule Elk at Point Reyes National Seashore. Such a reverence that I think is exemplified both in in that dream that was given to me, this elk that was gifted to Jimmy, and then this relationship that Teresa has with the Thule elk and the importance of these species, not only for food, for sustenance, so that we can make a conscientious decision to stay away from factory farms so that animals get treated with more respect, but also for cultural reasons, for ceremony, um, and for our identities, what the elk mean to us, um, and what the elk and what what key species mean to indigenous tribes all over, or indigenous nations all over uh, the continent and the Western Hemisphere. Um, and then I'll just you can go to the next slide just because this is another cool picture of some of our mentees and a couple of mentors in the photo as well. Um, but I hope that all of this today kind of shows you the importance of hunting as a part of traditional ecological knowledge um, and the the importance of people of color having connection to the outdoors um, and the importance also of traditional ecological knowledge being seen as a current um, and viable solution to uh, climate change, to deforestation. Um, and I truly believe that once the people with the owner's manuals are given the power and given the support that we need in order to care for our own communities and care for our own landscapes, that's when the earth will heal again and we can heal as people. So Niawa for having me. Um, I hope that I hope that, that was what y'all were looking for, Ty. <laughs> Lydia, thank you so much. Uh, if you bear with me, I'm gonna make some adjustments here just so they can hear you and, and I, we can take any questions. So uh, Lydia, thank you for, for that um, the testimony and, and and kind of review of, of the role of hunting and, and traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to open up for to any questions. Uh, for those in the conference room, I, I muted the, the conference room, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, those online, feel free to post a question, and I can just uh, read the question for Lydia. While you're thinking of that, I, I do have a question, Lydia. So, um, you know, in, in learning about and understanding more about the organization that, that you lead, um, you know, the, the, what experiences do you have with, with uh, uh, d different uh, uh, groups of, of uh, hunters of color? So uh, African-Americans, uh, 
yeah. uh, uh, Latinos, I assume, uh, uh, obviously. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, any uh, any interesting observations, I guess, in in in, yeah. in in how you approach their engagement and so forth. Yeah, I'm glad you ask. Um, and first and foremost, I think that the important the important thing that we always lead with is the need for people from their own communities to care and tend to their own communities. If that if that makes sense, I'm sure there's a better way to say that. But for example. I don't have any experience being, um, you know, a black hunter from the South. And I know that that experience is so much different than being an indigenous woman living here in the Pacific Northwest who hunts. Um, and so for that reason, we really like to rely on our communities. Like I said, we have 12 different communities throughout the U.S. Um, where people from, uh, let's see, for example, Kentucky, someone from Kentucky leaves the Kentucky group. Um, someone from South Carolina leads the South Carolina group. Someone from Texas leads the Texas group. And um, our ambassadors are from all different walks of life, from all different communities. And we also like to say that we are culturally inclusive, not culturally specific, um, because I hate that that term, because then we lump uh, indigenous into one culture. And clearly, <laughs> we all know that's not the case. Or we lump even black into one culture, and clearly that's not the case. Um, there's different experiences all throughout the United States. Um, and I think that one of the other observations and also, um, data points that's interesting to me is that when they looked at hunters throughout the United States, um, they're, they're looking at licenses. So license hunters throughout the United States. And that means that indigenous people who are hunting, uh, on reservation with permission from tribal council or, or whatever um, that aren't in the res that aren't in the license system aren't necessarily being counted, uh, which might be sometimes when I talk to indigenous folks, people are like, well, we actually everyone hunts in my family, um, which is good. And that's the goal, right? <laughs> for everyone to have that connection. But for urban natives or for a lot of youth um, or people who whose parents didn't teach them these skills, it's something that allows us to connect to our identity. Um, but from from a, a ethnicity standpoint, they looked at they looked at the numbers and they found that 97% of hunters identify as white uh, people with licenses, and then that other whatever 3.7% that was left, um, or whatever 2.7% that was left, um, two percent were in the South and they identified as African American or Black, and then that, that leftover remaining percentage was um, Latino hunters in the midwest and they um you know again come from a long line of tradition traditions and hunting there as do black hunters in the south and then throughout the rest of the country people of color did not show up we were what, what we what you call statistically statistically insignificant in the findings um because there were so few communities of color hunting so it is something where you know, you see a lot of black hunters in the South. You'll see a lot of Latinx hunters in the Midwest. Um, and it's something where I found even, uh, you know, my partner, Jimmy's family is from Venezuela. They all hunted in Venezuela the second they moved to the United States. There's a lot of regulations in a different language, and it's kind of hard to continue that tradition. Um, it's also something where we see, you know, Jimmy's best friend, uh, Raul, is from, from Mexico, and they grew up hunting in Mexico. But then when they moved to the U.S., he said, you know, we don't do that here. That's not something that we do. Um, and it's almost like putting people into a box saying, you know, that's a white person thing to do. Um, and it's hard to, to see that disconnect and happen to our communities where hunting has been such an important part of all of our cultures. Thank you. Your it does, Olivia. Thank you. And and uh, I think they unmuted themselves at the conference room. So um if there's a question there uh online uh, feel free to ask yeah, i have a question uh, you were going you were talking a little bit about how uh, when conservation organizations are kind of put us in a, a big green box as you were saying um does giving them a more indigenous perspective on hunting allow them to uh to kind of change their attitudes towards uh what conservation really means yes I think that that is an important question. It's something that I don't believe I mentioned, but we've even found, I've even found in, in my personal life or in our conversations with the Nature Conservancy or different uh, land trust organizations throughout the U.S., 
that they'll often say no to hunting, but then they'll have clauses in their um, in their easements or or MOUs that say this land is open to indigenous communities for all ceremonial and foraging purposes. And then I'll kind of point to that and say, okay, well, <laughs> part of part of that has always been and needs to continue to be this relationship with animals that we have as well. Um, and actually we've seen some really positive uh, changes. We've seen, I've even had uh, people who say, you know what, I'm vegetarian or you know what, I'm vegan. And I understand your need your your for your culture for your identity for you to continue to be an indigenous person to be able to forage and hunt and practice ceremony on on these lands so yes i do believe that there is something to it um and i think that if people aren't fond of hunting or if they're not if they don't understand you know how factory farming is actually much worse for the planet and worse for the animals um they they often will have some sort of reverence for the first peoples of this land um whether or not that's actually turned into support and funding is another story <laughs> but i do believe it it's an important it's an important talking point thank you lydia okay i i have a question on the chat so it says uh, thanks for introducing us to hunters of color i understand the importance of finding folks in their community to be ambassadors for hunters of color do you have recommendations for folks who are not part of a, a BIPOC community to get involved? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. So um, we actually have mentors and who are uh, not BIPOC. And so that's something we, our ambassadors all, um, we require that they are BIPOC or identify as people of color um, because of that shared experience, hopefully with their communities as well. And our mentors, we'd be silly <laughs> if we didn't allow people with with skills, um, hunting, foraging, whatever uh, other survival skills you might have to get involved in our communities. And also we host community events where anyone and everyone is invited. Uh, we would hope that those would be inclusive, otherwise we're not doing our job. <laughs> um, and so if you want, if you're, if you do have any of those skills you'd like to share, you can always get involved with a local community. And again, I know College Station and Lubbock are not close whatsoever. <laughs> I forget how big your, your state is. Um, but always keep an eye out on our website, sign up for our newsletter, and you can see um, different events that might be happening closer to you um, and how you can get involved as a mentor um, or even just part of a community as well. No, absolutely, Lydia. And, and uh, for those online, we shared the, the website of, of your organization in the chat. Uh, I, I might add also that um, this semester, one of our faculty are actually teaching is teaching a course of, of principles and practices in, of hunting conservation. And so, so it's a pretty cool course uh, going from, uh, you know, basic firearm safety to the, the North American model uh, 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 principles to uh, going on on a on a hunt, uh, harvesting um, you know that wild game and preparing it, and so really all aspects of of just the the role of hunting and, and conservation. Hence the the name of the course. So some okay. of our some of our folks online are are um, uh, are in in that course, but but uh, I think uh, the the you piqued their interest when you you talked about a community in in Lubbock. I think. There may be a, a strong interest in having a community in Aggieland, so so we we, we appreciate that. Right, well, Lydia, first uh, appreciate your time and, and appreciate you working uh, through the technology uh, challenges. But uh, but again, uh, 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 great work and and whatever we can do uh, to assist from uh, Texas, let us know. Uh, I'm uh, I'm seeing uh, uh, there's a, a call for an Aggie chapter of Hunters of Color. So, uh, so again, appreciate that. And, and those online, thank you for uh, your patience. And with that, uh, we'll, we'll say goodbye to Lydia and, and wish her uh, a good rest of the day. You take care, everyone. Uh -huh.